start off that way. Well, it looks like we are back. We do apologize for the audio issues. That is the, uh, the, the excitement and the angst of being live, live yeah. is you can try to practice, but you never know what's going to happen. So welcome to Repair University, the second edition for 2017, where we are talking about post-repair inspections. Now, there's a variety of ways a post-repair inspection happens to a collision center, and there's also benefits and reasons for post-repair inspections in the insurance industry. So we're gonna try to cover a lot of that today while we look at these two cars, yep. um, and the four of us walk through it. But real quick, before we get going on the cars, which I know is where everybody wants to go right now, Larry, walk us through the different types. What are you wearing, Larry? All right, I'm gonna do a little product placement. <laughs> Some people, some people are actually having some product placement around here on everything. So I figured I would just join the, um, since I don't have all these uh, financial things that you guys can do with uh, a big company there. So I, I, I spent a lot of money on my tape. Well, um, I, I do appreciate the 233 masking tape for 3M. I do. I mean, if you're going to mask up, do it with the best, right? Yeah, right? So that's awesome. All right, Larry, walk us through the different types of post repair inspections. There's a few different types. I mean, most of the stuff the shop can handle, we, we have our cosmetic type damages where a paint job doesn't match, uh, it's dirty, it's, um, it it's doesn't have the right shine and sheen, something that's correctable fairly easily. Uh, then the next one would be you have um, aftermarket components on there or factory components that just aren't lining up properly, maybe needs adjustment or something like that, usually in conjunction with probably some sort of paint mis mismatching. Uh, then you have um, probably some sort of uh, welded on component issue, uh, usually a secondary or tertiary type uh, uh, component that's welded onto the vehicle that maybe is causing some of the misalignment. And um, most of those are correctable by the, by the uh, repair facilities. When you do need to call an expert in, you're usually getting involved in something that requires uh, a, a, a full inspection of a structural component, uh, unirail, uh, full frame rail, uh, something that affects airbag timing or the airbags themselves or you have uh, scanned the vehicle and find out that um, not only is uh, um, the structure off but then you also have numerous codes on the car which might lead you to you know into court or something like that where you need to really call a professional. So those are some of the categories I guess if you wanted to put them into categories of the post repair inspections. Right. Now the reason that customer is going to end up either with someone like us mm -hmm. or back in your facility um, are kind of in two ways. One, there's the customer-driven complaint. Something's off. Something's up. They're upset with something, whether it's paint or fit, alignment, drivability, um, a convenience feature that they had on the vehicle when they brought it to you isn't working and they bring that back. Um, and then the other is just kind of a quality control measure. And, you know, Roger, you and I taught that for a lot of years in the insurance industry. We did. Actually, we would teach the fact that we would want to check for estimate accuracy to make sure that all the repairs are being performed correctly. Um, take a look at some of the quality, but really when it came to quality, you really couldn't tell because you couldn't test the wells, you couldn't check to make sure that all the adhesive, the proper adhesives were used, and so it did lack some, some credibility to it. Right. There are a few things today that we can do uh, without doing destructive te testing. In fact, today we're not going to do any destructive testing on anything that we find. No. <laughs> so we're going to roll through it. Let's get to the cars um, and talk about the Honda Accord that's behind us. 2016 Honda Accord. Um, really light damage, estimate was under $3,000. This is a perfectly happy customer. The customer gave the shop all tens um, on the customer service. Um, they loved the repair, they loved the speed. Um, this was a couple of days in and out of the facility and appeared to be just really a bumper cover and a few little auxiliary parts to that. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, Larry, walk us through. The, you got a chance to see this on the visual inspection when it rolled in. Well, a couple of things that we noticed right off the bat. I mean, there's a slight discoloration between the front fascia and the and the fenders on the left and right side. We had taken a look at the um, the, the back fascia to the quarter panels, and that was also a little off, also, but not the same discoloration, I guess you would say. So the the color might have been a little off there. Not such a big deal, and no one dies because of color mismatch. But <clears throat> everything leads you to something else. As we looked around the car and we stood further back, we noticed that one headlight um, didn't seem to be sitting in the mounting area the proper way. So we saw a different gap between the hood and the headlight on the left side versus the right side. And then we laid down and we looked from laying on the ground, we looked up at the bumper and we saw the underside of the bumper wasn't painted in certain areas. We saw some very rough spots on the bumper fascia, we saw uh, um, some 
some, some areas that were, had no paint coverage whatsoever. So that led us to believe, okay, we need to look maybe a little bit further and looking at the estimate, finding out that they did replace the uh, bumper uh, impact bar and the absorber, we said, all right, you know what, let's take the bumper cover off, let's see what's behind there. We found two missing clips uh, that were missing underneath on the, on the bottom of it and a different type of clip that was installed at the top. So we took the sight shield off and uh, um, Madison and I decided we're gonna take off the bumper cover and take a look behind there. And we found some, uh, some issues that we like scratched our heads at and it's like, hmm, that's not right. <laughs> All right. Well, let's get into that. Let's get that bumper cover off right now. Okay. Um, and let's start talking about what we found on it a little bit. I wanna get the hood release. Really now, Larry, Oops, in the process of, of after we got the bumper cover off, you did manage to hook up and read the computer on this car. What information did you find? Well, I did, I, I did something a little bit different. What I did was is I used the Bosch uh, CDR kit, which is uh, for accident reconstruction, uh, for accident reconstruction and for um, diagnosis of airbag systems if they were deployed or not deployed or if they made a recording or not. And in this particular case, it had a non-deployment event that was recorded and we went ahead and we decided that um, we're going to review the whole thing and it should be up on the screen now I believe and it's probably hard for people to read but we found out the vehicle was doing um, about 30 miles per hour five seconds before algorithm uh, enable which is basically the car woke up and says oh I think I'm going to be in an accident kind of like you're carrying coffee you're walking along you almost go and trip and you kind of put your hands out but you don't fall that's what the car was doing and uh, two seconds before algorithm uh, enable, the ABS kicked in uh, for the last two seconds uh, till enable came up. And at 17 miles per hour, the car made contact with another vehicle. So we do know that there was a, enough applied impact force that it caused the vehicle to have a negative uh, uh, six mile delta V or a change in direction. Basically, the car rebounded backwards. So that told me, you know what? I'm wondering what's also with the car. Um, I'd like to scan it. That's already telling me I need to scan it. Also, I wanted to pre-measure the car. So by pre-measuring it, I'll find out if my structure is right or not because I didn't see that on the estimate. And I didn't see anything about scanning the vehicle or even a post-scan afterwards. And the biggest problem is most of the modern cars in the last, I'd say since 2012, uh, there's a few prior to that, but since 2012, most vehicles have some sort of uh, yeah, some scale some in the passenger like seat yeah, that, that, that prior uh, basically differentiates between a small rear-facing child seat, a small adult being a woman, or a full, you know, a fifth percentile male. And that shuts on and off the airbag on the passenger side. It also changes the uh, uh, deployment factors as far as is it going to deploy f uh, with one igniter or with two igniters or a delay between the igniters. So that's really important to scan that type of stuff, which is why I requested uh, Jay come in and take care of that for us. Right, and, and one thing to keep in mind is, is this was kind of minimal damage on the car when you looked at it. And obviously, after post tear down, the shop discovered the absorber and the impact bar. But just keep in mind, folks, visual indications of, of damage on the car aren't necessarily indicators of the speed or the severity of impact. We've built these cars where they absorb and then hide a lot of that damage. But you got to think, we had a 17 mile an hour impact on the front of this vehicle. And well, that warrants some serious consideration of some things to be done. So one of the things we decided to do, Roger, based on the fact that we had some damage, was we were going to go ahead and, and take some measurements of that. So if you want to go ahead and grab the matrix wand, I'll do that. set up the board, we can get going on measuring of the vehicle before we talk about probably what everyone may have already noticed, which is this long wiring pigtail <laughs> laying on the floor right now. <laughs> um, that's, that's, we're going to get to that. <laughs> <laughs> but Jake, um, you know, Honda's had a position statement since midsummer that every <clears throat> vehicle that is involved in a collision event gets a pre and a post repair scan. And well, that's what you do. You are right. our scan guy, we've yep. decided yep. Uh, with the Aztec tool. Um, so we brought you in. Um, tell us what you found when you scan the car. Yeah, it's um, you know, like Larry said, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of evidence in the car that either somebody's either had some kind of a code reader on it at some point uh, after the repairs because somebody cleared the faults out. But what they failed to do is they did not do the seat occupancy detection calibration as required by Honda. And as a result, when we went in and looked at the live data on the seat, that kind of tells us the heartbeat of the car. What's going on at this moment right now? we found that the seat was registering three pounds even though it was completely empty. That's a severe issue. I mean, yeah. so just the difference between three pounds, I know I have a child, 
um, and he rides in the front seat and a lot of people have their kids in and out of the seat and that seat sensor is telling us when that bag is going to deploy or not right for the safety right. of that passenger right and if you think about it when uh, you know shops are trying to figure out what airbag components do I need to check or what do I need to replace you know a lot of the in the information providers it doesn't tell us how many occupants were in the car what was their seat position and were they wearing their seat belt so all of those things play a role in the deployment factor all right so right now we would basically say this car is unsafe really to drive unsafe. it's unsafe to operate because we don't know what's going to happen in a subsequent collision event will the airbag deploy as intended to for the person sitting in the car so if you had a 37 36 and a half pound child included in the rear facing child seat sitting in the front which you don't want the airbag to deploy and it's off by three pounds saying i have three pounds in there that now 36 and a half pound child now becomes 39 and a half pounds yeah. which means the airbag may deploy depending on the significance of the applied impact force and the change in delta v in that particular vehicle uh the airbag could deploy which could possibly push the child back and injure the child so you have a a, a serious situation here where just a, a, a scanning of the vehicle, which took you what? 20 minutes. 20 minutes. Yeah. You know, tops that go through it um, could actually wind up getting somebody killed or injured and open up the liability of the shop, you know, immensely. And, and we did talk to the owner of this yeah. vehicle and found that she did have two small children. Right. And it starts, it starts back with the repair information. This vehicle's been involved in a crash. Yep. Start there. What's involved, what is required after a crash? The Wait, seat. you want people to read? Oh, uh, well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's this, no pictures? <laughs> the, the seat output check is one of them. And the shop, whether they used a tool or not, they did not do the seat calibration. So if I had access to this data ahead of time, I could have wrote a more accurate bid. Right. I could have been pre-warned on certain things that I need to perform on this car, which is setting the car for proper repair strategies right. as it enters the workflow. And don't, don't assume that you, because you do it for one, that you must do it for all. There are certain manufacturers that don't require you to re-zero the seat. That's where we have to look at the repair information and read, as my friend Larry <laughs> yep, says. Yep, exactly. So, uh, there's no such thing as a generalized repair procedure that applies to every car. Right. Um, one thing we I do, do have uh, one quick question from yeah. Donald Richardson. Hey, hey Donald. <laughs> What's happening? Was the, scar, was the car scanned at the repair facility? Um, right now, we, we haven't talked to the repair facility too much on this car. Uh, we will get in there. There is no charge for a scan on the estimate. However, we did discuss when we did scan this car that there were some codes we were anticipating yep. based on what would have happened and how the car would have been repaired mm -hmm. and, and started and key cycles done through the facility that we didn't find, which leads us to believe that possibly um, an aftermarket scanner, one like you might pick up off a tool truck or find on eBay. I've been seeing these posts around the internet lately, yes. a $40 yep. scanner. Right. Um, that maybe someone, because the tech went to his toolbox, pulled out his and cleared the codes, thought he did a good job, but did end up actually missing something um, that Because requires it's not set up to read that type of yeah, information. Yeah, it's not set up that's for that data. Right. So, yep. um, a lot of the, the, the C-type stuff is proprietary. Yep. A lot of times you need a special uh, program for it and right. weights to be able to do it. So it right. may just be a regular code reader, clearer, scanner type of yep. thing, and that could possibly be the issue. If they did do it, which there's some indications that they did do something or someone did something. They did it for free. Right. You know, because they didn't charge for it. So yeah. it's, not on the, it's not on the estimate. I don't work for free. And the other thing <laughs> here, too, to consider is that anything connected by wire really opens this door up for scanning. Yeah. You know, even as we take a look at the front bumper on this vehicle over here, we have wires that went down to the fog lamps, but also we had wiring go into the, the back side of the bumper reinforcement, which is actually what piece of the car, Jay? Yeah, that's, that's the ambient temp sensor. You know, and you've got, you've got one sensor that seems seems like a, a small thing, you know, uh, and a lot of times in a collision center, they come in, it's just two wires hanging there. Uh, but in, in vehicle cases, that, that sensor uh, is in charge for the ambient temp outside, the cold start enrichment for the fuel injection, and the automatic climate control. So, so if it's not operating right, I could have poor engine performance and also loss in fuel right. economy, which might not, might not, will not press, be noticed right away. When you press auto on the AC, that may not function. It may not well. function yep. right, and it never blows cold. I know Mercedes Benz is set up that way specifically. Even where you put the vents, when you go to dis, you know, disconnect that particular switch, because uh, there's a whole relearning process for it with the with the doors and stuff inside the uh, uh, air conditioning system, and that can really cause you to think that my air conditioning isn't blowing. Right. You know, blowing cold air. I'm going to take it in for service and paying for service that isn't needed because no one read to find out that the ambient temperature sense has to be reset. So, here, so here's the thing: if I'm a technician and I'm looking on this vehicle and I'm moving things that I've typically unplugged in the past and plugged them back with no problems, 
on today's cars, because of their sophistication, we really have to look at everything now that's connected by wire right. to make sure how our repair process, even though we unplug something and plug it back in again, how it impacts the whole car. You know, and if, 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 they, if they just pulled the Honda service information, they would have found that Honda actually offers a connector kit that you can buy for this vehicle. They do authorize repairs to the wiring, provided it's not an SRS harness, and they could have charged for those things and build out a part, but yet they did not. And it know. was specific to the fog lamp, too, right. if I'm not it was mistaken. one little small harness that goes from the fog lamp to yeah. uh, just a clip right. to make it easy to get yeah. the bumper off and then the wire harness on the vehicle itself. So now they've ruined the wire harness. Now, right. do we replace the wire harness as a whole unit right. or do we you know, re-splice it again? And we already sent in a question to somebody that we know at Honda yeah. to find out the answer on this particular car, which, what we're gonna charge back for. Yep. And, and Larry and Jake, it. if I splice these wires, if I don't use the right, right <laughs> strategies, I could actually change the input from that, that sensor. Well, they didn't even do a good bad job. No. <laughs> you know, first off, you can make a, a you know, too long of a wire harness you change your resistance. Um, too short of a harness, you change it. Also, they didn't even use uh, uh, shrink wrap, yeah. waterproof type crimp yeah, connectors, which right. a lot of companies want. They just use regular wire crimp connectors, which the, the biggest problem with this car, besides the airbag uh, 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 passenger seat system being off by three pounds, is this could have caused a fire somewhere down the road because right. the wires were spliced exactly together. There was no protection whatsoever besides a little bit of tape being put around and not even really, like really banged up really well like a lot of guys do. Yeah. And water could have got in there and started a fire. Kind of you reminds know. me of 1990 when I was building uh, speakers and boxes and, and doing mini trucking um, when we would be putting in the stereo systems. That's kind of what my work looked like back then. But we're gonna get to that in a little bit more detail. We're gonna talk okay. about that wiring harness and pigtail repair. But Roger, real quick, you measured with the Matrix One. We did have some concerns based on some alignment issues with we the did. headlights. What would you find? We were very concerned about that. So what we did is we took the Matrix One, we actually identified certain key points of the structure so we could check it for accuracy to see if it was in the right location. Um, we used the Matrix One, we imaged this vehicle, took a very short period of time, and we brought this information back over to the Matrix database. And what we did is we found that as we did our cross checks, we uh -huh. found everything in perfect spec. All right. Even though the bumper beam was replaced and, and you know, you still want to check this. It's amazing how many repair shops do not measure the vehicle during the time of the estimate because they could have identified issues if there had been or not. Yeah. Just a real quick little, uh, real quick little about five minutes is what it took you. That's it. And we had a complete three dimensional uh, vision of the vehicle. Yep. So uh, what I love about that tool is it really lets me get a good picture of the repair without having to put it on my rack, um, without having to bring necessarily my A technician who's been trained to use my car aligner system um, to measure the cars out completely. Um, and, and really anyone in my facility from my porter to even my estimators could, could put this, this tool into work. As long as they're computer savvy and they love it, the, the, the learning curve is very low. The thing about this whole thing is that even if I have this image, one thing, it provides great documentation for your bill payer. Two, if I ever have to check something else, once the images are taken, as long as I can see it in the image, I can remeasure even though I didn't do it the first time. So it really provides a lot of benefits. And, and also too, since we're in a post repair type video today, we, if we had this car inspected and somebody brought complaints back, we could actually go back into the original images a year later, if necessary, and remeasure. Yeah. Well, and it's, it's just great to, you know, we know we have to measure these cars. There's no way around it these days. We do fully believe in 100% measurement for everything that comes in. Yep. But let's face it, we know that, that that's tough. A lot of us, have, we have one rack. I have one rack, right? I have one machine. Um, and so that, that's kind of an issue. So anything you can do to ease that, um, you know, the Matrix One, the Point X system from Carliner, yep. a fast and quick, easy, down and dirty way of just knowing whether you need to know that you have a problem. So let's get into this bumper cover a little bit, Larry, um, and our wiring issues. So oh, real quick, before we get into that, but when we go to over the wiring issues, we have one question, that, one question from Sergio just came in. Hey. Um, I guess Jake and I can handle it. Jake, you want to take it real quick? Yeah, so Sergio asked uh, if, if we need to show data like speed of impact, will the Aztec scanner help with that? So in certain cases, uh, what you're referring to there is freeze frame data. And all the OEMs track freeze frame of data to a certain extent, though it is in a limited data set. So Larry, in this particular vehicle, we had to use CDR to pull that data. We'll use CDR, which once again, it's not really for collision repairers because no one cares how fast the vehicle was going. I was just trying to prove a point of what I have to go through when I, when I have to do uh, court cases for some of my stuff that I get involved with because a lot of times you're going through a Fry or a Dalbert hearing on uh, um, 
being deemed an expert through the gatekeeper, which is the judge. And there's different stuff uh, like uh, for a federal case versus a state case, two huge differences on how things have to be done. And um, I wanted to prove a point of, hey, look, I got the equipment I'm utilizing, I'm trying to do this. Yep. Some of the OEM information will give you, like Kia and Hyundai, uh, in their diagnostic uh, um, uh, machines or software, which is what people call scanners, yep. uh, they do have the ability to read the uh, uh, black box technology stuff. The right. Mechanics usually don't look for it. Right. We have a different dumbed down version of that that portion, but most of the companies will record something in ROM yeah, usually. It, and it's important to remember that the Aztec is not a scanner. Um, we couldn't use OEM scan tools and create a scanner. Uh, we, we created an interface device that allows us to communicate to an OEM scan tool. So um, back in Dallas and in Florida, we have multiple OEM scan tools that we're communicating with. Yeah. That's awesome. basically, yeah, basically it's a portal to go back and forth. Right. So let's just skip back over. Guys, you got questions? Please bring them in. Yeah. Now, we're not going to get too far into the paint issues that were on the bumper. So on the estimate, there was um, color sand and buff time. Um, and to me, if you're getting paid color sand and buff time, that means there's a technician either in your detail department or your painter or your painter's helper that's laying eyes on the bumper. So seeing... Um, a lot of the paint issues on this never should have gone out the door. Um, but when we got the bumper cover off, I will tell you we were surprised. Technically, we kind of thought this was going to be an easy estimate. We had a happy customer. We didn't have, it was mostly bolted parts. What could possibly go wrong? And as a shop owner and an insurer at one point, I probably would have been the same. What could have possibly gone wrong exactly. with this repair? Larry, what'd you find? Well, first off, this is a, a prime, both of these cars are prime examples of it's definitely not the insurance company's fault, and it never is the insurance company's fault. Right. I don't care what anyone says to me. You, you made a choice as an owner of a shop to accept whatever you're doing on their program or whatever you're accepting if you're not on their program, what yep. you're accepting to take in. The customer is the one who pays you all the time. Vehicle owner, either being third party or first party. This has a brand new factory bumper on it. It has a brand new factory headlight, a brand new factory fog lamp. Um, actually, we can prove that the parts came from the factory because they left some labels on here, including on the bumper reinforcement. Right. Now, uh, the other interesting aspect is, is that the bumper reinforcement wasn't painted. Uh, it was painted originally. We double-checked that, and they didn't paint it in, you know, when they put it on. Not that it, it matters that much because it does get covered. Uh, what I did find is that one of the bolts was loose, just basically finger-tightened, on the bumper reinforcement. So you're starting to add mistakes up as you go along and you're starting to see more and more of these things add up and saying, okay, look, now you're talking carelessness. You know, you have one mistake, mistakes happen. Two mistakes, you know, everyone trips every so often. Three, four, five mistakes on the same car, you're starting to show a pattern. And if you show that type of pattern, I guarantee I go and look at all the rest of your jobs, you're gonna see similar type mistakes where you're not repairing anything the right way. And that becomes a major, major issue. And this is all factory brand new parts that no one took the time to uh, 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 do some diagnostic stuff. Right. And so I never, I, so never never go about, about, oh, I was going to say, I never even thought about bolts before, but that was a great example until I went um, to a collision center that, that is, doesn't exist anymore in California, but Marcos Collision Center. And Marcos had a, um, a QC process in his shop that involved marking and verifying yes. every bolt that yep. they had installed on the car and then it, there was a quality control system for that. So, that was so what you're describing here, Larry, with the technology on today's cars, we have to have a cultural change within the business model, which means a, a, a cultural change of accountability, ways to have other people within the repair process checking and double checking to make sure everything's done during the repairs, not after the repairs. Well, the biggest problem is a post repair inspection inside the shop, or even what people call a QC before the car goes home. A QC should be, all right, did we wipe all the edges? Did we, did we wash everything? Does it, does, did we wipe all the wax off the car? Are the radio presets redone? Not, are the lug nuts tight? Does the car drive correctly? That should have been done already. The bigger issue is departmental checklists. Uh, um, in this particular car here, departmental checklist could have caught some of the little minor things yes. here um, on that vehicle we'll see afterwards if you do a quick check at the end or a, or a quality check at the end it's not going to prevent what you did you need to catch it right then and there not when you're done with the car as right. each repair step is being performed it, right. right and one guy signs off another the tech says i did all these things the foreman manager uh damage assessor walks over and goes okay you did these i'm going to check them so at least someone's there to double check on it and make sure it's done properly right 
So let's talk about this. So this fog lamp has what's well, basically a small little pigtail that goes from into the fog lamp to down in well, here. Well, it's to actually a wire harness. Yeah, yeah. Pig, well, pigtail well, something that comes out of the inside of it. I like pigtail. It <laughs> makes uh, no, me it's, happy. It's, 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 um, yeah. <laughs> it's going into the lamp and down to it, and it's waiting to accept the port from the wire. For some lamp. reason, yeah, they must have made it that way. They felt yep. that it was easier. I guess maybe if you take the plastic splash shield off, you could reach up and unplug it easier with it facing down versus sideways, whatever the case is, yeah. because right. it's a very small little wire yep. on us. And sometimes these are also the OEM's acknowledgement of that's going to be a commonly damaged. About six, Rogers, about 60% of the cars have a front bumper on they them, do. on oh. the estimate. Oh, yeah. So probably acknowledgement that, that this is going to be a damaged area, and let's try to find a way to make a quick and easy repair and not necessarily let's replace the whole harness at $40 right. an hour. And Honda is very, co very conscious about repairs. Yeah. So hey. what, what happened is it appears as probably these were damaged, and the shop, maybe on a Friday, made a decision to do something other than replace this component and then follow the wiring repair procedures. That could be a possibility. It could have been a possibility where the plug was broken in this area here, and that's why you have to buy the lamp assembly. They could have had another one on the property, took that lamp out and goes, oh, we don't have a plug or whatever, and they made something fit. Uh, obviously, somebody thought they knew better because I've been doing it for 30 years and I never had a problem yeah. beforehand. <laughs> yeah. We hear stories about that all the time. So, uh, once again, it's quality checks. You don't fix a car or bring a car in to start repairs until all the parts have arrived. And all the parts have been, you know, checked that they are correct for the application you're using them for. All right. So, what we ended up with was this. Well, we shaved down the, uh, the plug. <laughs> whoever it was, to miss a clip on the back side. It has a clip on the front that doesn't barely fit in there. They jammed it together. I had a hard time trying to get it out of there. I thought they almost glued it in. Um, and then they just ran this wire all the way back and just crimped it at the same location here. And they left all this wire open. At least they grabbed some of that. But the wire seems to be like 35 feet longer than what they actually needed it. Right. Um, so uh, it, it's, it, it's an issue. And, um, you know, once again, this goes back to pride, goes back to reading, goes back to training. I mean, the, the iCar uh, course uh, that Honda made that goes through iCar for their uh, certification program actually has one whole class on wiring repair and wire harness repair and what you can and can't do and how to do it. And even they sell the tools exactly. and they sell the, the actual the ends for almost, it even says we sell the ends or the connectors for most all our wiring harnesses. Yeah. You know, speaking yeah. of wiring harnesses, even if they're braided, braiding is a definitely important thing to do. Um, because if you're getting working on wheel sensors and you have a cut wire there, if you don't braid it back up and you don't have the exact length, they could throw that wheel sensor off and what it's feeding the computer. Right. It's yeah. kind of crazy. This is a prime example to me of, I hear often from shops that the OEMs don't build cars to repair. We're building cars to total loss. They make them impossible to fix. And here's a sample. Toyota gave us everything we needed to do the right job. They anticipated damage to that area. They made the connectors, the tools, the wires, and the procedure available. But we just didn't do it because yeah, we were That's, that's a great point. I pulled up the, uh, the actual procedure here uh, within yeah. Honda, and it talks about what you can and can't do with actual harness repair. Um, and they do, they do, like you said, endorse it, and they'd like you to back probe it. But after you've made the repair, they want you to check the system for DTCs and even do a function test where you're going to send a command to that fog light to come on. Fog light, tell me everything you're programmed to do. Well, I'm programmed when the switch is on that I come on. I'm also programmed when the key is in the on position that I illuminate the driveway for the vehicle owner. So we're going to go through and do those function tests as part of our repair to confirm our fix. You know, you think about this for a second. If I don't do this before it leaves, I'm opening up my door, doors for a comeback. Right. If you take a look at a comeback, the cost, if you take all the labor hours combined in your repair facility and put them together, it's easily $400. Do you want that to happen? Yeah. Roger, I looked really hard for the fog light warning light on the dash. And There's no warning light. No, there, there is no warning okay. lamp. No Just clarify that. That's yeah. the, yeah. what they call the, the myth information. Yeah. As they say, uh, J J uh, James from Toyota said it years ago, it's myth information, not misinformation. There's a myth and then they give you the wrong information about it so you slam the words together. Listen, if they had a, 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 an idiot light or a malfunction indicator lamp for every system in the car, you, you, it'd be on all the time. Yeah, it, would, yeah. it would literally look like a, 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 a Christmas tree lit up. 
there's too many lights, you have to scan the car. Anybody out there who thinks that, well, if the light isn't on the dashboard, I don't have to scan no. the car, you're a complete idiot, and please do me a favor, sell your business, leave the insurance company, go open a hot dog stand because you're way too stupid to be involved in this business anymore. I'm talking about hot dogs, we're almost to lunch. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. All right. uh, but so you gotta here's wake the thing. up, guys, you gotta, <laughs> <leave>. you <laughs> so gotta understand it. If this thing does gonna throw a light on, it wouldn't pick up that it's the yeah. seat's out of calibration at the moment. Never. It'll, it'll sense that it's still there, it's all hooked up, but the calibration piece, no light. And it's kind of like getting on your scale and driven. setting it back three pounds and putting it ahead three pounds. Wait, can you yeah. do that? That's all it is. Yes, of course you can. That's how I lose weight. I just Holy keep moving it back. Holy I yeah. gotta get that done. I, that's all I do. I get on the scale each morning. I move it back seven, eight pounds. It's hey, I scored. <laughs> <laughs> My weight loss goes just got attainable. <laughs> yes. I think I'm gonna, I'm gonna rock this. <laughs> All right, so that was a great car, guys. It was small, minor damage, something yep. that should have been really easy to do, but one, because we failed to access the OEM repair information Correct. as the before the repair began and the estimate was written, we made mistakes. Two, we failed to pre-scan, we failed to post-scan, yep. so we missed some issues there as well. And we've set our customer up for failure. I would hate to see a customer say, oh, my fog lamp doesn't work. They drive into the dealer. The dealer takes the bumper down in the service department and goes, one, not covered. Two, you now owe us for the labor that we did to, right. to do that on your car. So um, let's go a little bit deeper. So All the right. next car we have here is a customer complaint. This car, this customer's not happy. The repair was approximately about a year ago. And since that time, she's had nothing but issues with the rear of the car, from the lift gate to the bumpers to the wiper arms, it just seems like, in her opinion, about every month or other month since the repair, she's back at the dealership for a problem in which she is now constantly being told, well, that's not related, the wiper arm's not related, the lift gate's not related, none of that stuff's related. So she brought it in. Larry, you did a quick visual inspection. Tell us what you found. She's, uh, I got an overview of what she was pissed about. And, and you know, this is a prime example of no one plans to fail, they fail to plan. And, and this is a real prime example of another car here where uh, the car was impacted in the rear, uh, the quarter panel needed to be changed, it's a 2011, and the insurance company, um, non-DRP, both these are non-DRPs by the way, um, the insurance company agreed with the shop or whoever decided on it, was put a new factory quarter panel. Not a used quarter, factory quarter, brand new quarter panel on it. And we can't even fix a steel car correctly. <laughs> okay, this is not a, some highfalutin, German, wacky, nut job car. This is no different than a Chevy Suburban, okay, structurally. Um, the install process is no different than a Chevy Suburban, except that it's open butt joint versus a butt joint with backing in the sectioning areas. And they couldn't even do this right. You know, Larry, think about this. This car is seven years old. And so some people might say, well, this technology on the Honda, that's, that's, that's 2016, 2015. Now we have a seven-year-old vehicle, and it has all these electronic issues with it. And, and the per that's why the repairer said, yeah. well, in their opinion, they felt that these things were not loss-related. Based on no evidentiary proof. I yep. can't stand when people say, oh, that's not related to the incident. Okay, why? Well, it's just not. What are you basing it on? Just like when they say, well, the car looks like it's measured good. You know, it looks like, oh yeah, it doesn't look structurally damaged to me, or the lights aren't on, so it must be okay. That's an assumption you're making, and you're making assumptions with somebody else's life. When we walked around this vehicle, right off the bat, I mean, you, you even pulled out right away, you're, I'm at the side of the car looking at door gaps, and you're at the rear of the car, and you go, my God, why is this bumper hanging down so low in the rear? It's a wide, wide gap. And I said, yes, it does look odd. And then we looked at the left and right side, we saw that the gap was wider at the top, of the fascia to the quarter panel when compared to the bottom, mm -hmm. both on the left and right side. So I said, well, something's off there that just clips that hold on. The problem is, why is the bumper being exactly. forced down? Okay, because it does clip directly on the back. It clips at the top directly to the bumper reinforcement, which is bolted to the uh, uh, rear uh, frame rails. So we looked at that. We looked at the operation of the back gate. It opened and closed fine. Although Kristen said, yes, yeah, she went back and she had the pistons changed. I said, wait, which pistons? <laughs> Are they the prop pistons or is it the automatic piston that goes Correct. up? Correct. No, no, it was the prop piston. Seven-year-old car, this type of climate, eh, you know what? They probably just went and they got a little rusty or, you know, uh, uh, um, something with the, with the gas chamber or something went on it and you had to change those. Those I'm not concerned about. The wiper issue, the gate opening, some of the other stuff. The Parktronics, we noticed the sensors oh. were, <laughs> they're all crooked. They're yeah. not even lined up. Uh, yeah. yeah uh, you know, <laughs> now, once again, 
you look at it visually and say to yourself, well, some companies are going to angle them left and right. They're never going to put one this way, one that way, one this way, one that no. way, because it just doesn't aesthetically look good, and right. people will question it. They understand that some of the angled ones are because it's going outward, but not where they're crooked. So that looked funny to begin with. Then I looked at the fit and finish of the panels, the closure panels. This side panel's a little bit tighter in gap to the other side by about two, two and a half millimeters. I looked up the repair information on plus or minus, you know, for the gaps, and they're telling you what it should be, and it should be about five millimeters, give or take two millimeters. Uh, another thing is, is the paint job's dead on this side. The uh, um, luster, the, uh, um, the, the, the visual aspect of it is very, very dull. Uh, not the same type of orange peel as compared to the other side. I did do a uh, film thickness measurement on the opposite side of the car at the Alchemeter, and that, car's, that side of the car is completely untouched, never been painted. This side, on the other hand, I'm going to do some of those paint film thickness measurements on there, and um, while I'm doing that, uh, Jay can go over some of the stuff that he found <coughs> when we did a, well now it's a pre-scan, yeah. but it's our, excuse me, it's a post-scan, but it's our pre-scan for our diagnostic right. purposes, yeah. and you'd be shocked, like Roger brought up before, about it's a, a seven-year, eight-year-old car, and yes, it does have occupant weight sensor in it, but which wasn't affected in this case, I don't believe. Yep. But once again, this was at the dealer how many times? Five or six different six times, times since she got the car back. Yep. And you'd be shocked what Jake found on it. Well, I'm going to measure this yeah. real quick, and then we'll come back to me afterwards. Awesome. Yeah, and we're going to get Madison in here because we, we knew based on the visual inspection that it was time to do a little bit more teardown. So we're going to start that teardown. And Jake, let's talk through what you found when you got to working on this car with a scanner. Well, you know, like you said, it, what Larry said, it always starts with a plan. And we know that the vehicle's been involved in a collision. So we want to find out what does Honda require for a collision? What does Nissan require if the vehicle's involved in a collision? And that's any collision, small or big. So when I looked at that, there was a couple of seat belt inspections that need to be done. They did request a diagnostic health scan uh, outside of the position statement. Remember, the position statement doesn't share point of impact. And as repairers, when we're trying to justify this to insurers and customers, we need to build that case. We need to have the position statement, and we need to have four or five OEM documents that support why we're doing the different operations. So one of those operations, because I think we all agree that this is a welded on panel, is that we're going to do a battery disconnect. So never assume anything. And when you look at the OEM data right here, I pulled up the battery procedure. And it's pretty straightforward about taking it off and all that kind of stuff. But at the very bottom here, it says to reset electronic systems as necessary. So when I click that link, you're going to see I now have a list of things that I need to check in the event that a negative battery terminal is disconnected. Check, I'll give you this much. Not just welding the panel on, you weld pins yeah. on the panel. That's right. still welding. Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You yep. know, so I mean, if you're not doing paintless dent repair, let's say, or you're using hammer and dolly or hammer off dolly techniques, yep. once you start to weld pins on there, this car has, to, you, you have to disconnect the battery. So that could, not just welding a panel on, but right. even dent repair. It yeah. may be a miracle, but yeah. the miracle is that the battery is still coming in. And, it, and as, you, as you get into this thing, you see that the engine control system requires an idle air relearn. And that's for cars in different, in different altitudes. So if you're in Denver and the altitude's high, or if you're in Nebraska where it's low, that car's going to react differently in fuel injection concerns. It also says that if you don't do it with a scan tool, that a 10-minute drive test is required. So if you don't do it with a scan tool, you must drive the vehicle at least 10 minutes, and Nissan even says to use a stopwatch. So as you go a little further, you see that the steering angle sensor neutral position has to be relearned in this vehicle. So that ties into your braking system and your traction control. When we ran the health scan on this vehicle, we found four faults in the system. Three of those in the braking and traction control systems because the steering angle neutral position had not been relearned after the battery disconnect. The last one was because we actually had the AC disconnected in the back and uh, it was showing a current open circuit because we unplugged some connectors. Right. You know, that's an interesting thing because the bill payers out there will say, well, how can the steering angle sensor be off when we have a car hit in the right quarter panel? That's in the steering column right, right. behind the, the right behind the steering wheel. So my point is, without this documentation being included with your upload of your estimate, it's going to show that if, if this is there, you're going to get you're going to have a lively discussion. If right. it's not there and you're just using your opinion, you lose. Yep. Yeah, and it's, it's just sometimes as simple as R and I in a lift gate. So if I happen to have um, a vehicle where um, when I turn the wheel, my backup camera shows me where I'm, yeah. I'm going, 
Huge. And I just R and I that lift gate or, or yep. truck or deck lid for a, um, a repair. Now I'm onto a relearning situation, and these are yep. batteries. And, and and one thing to keep in mind, you're, we're basically talking about a computer, folks. So if I disconnected the battery, you know, to my computer, I'm going to go through a reboot process. There's a whole lot that the car is going to have to do, and that's what we're doing in collision repair. We're not fixing cars anymore. We're fixing rolling computers, and so much is tied to that yeah. steering angle sensor these days. Well, think about it. With a vehicle like this. Families usually buy these because they have little kids. Mm -hmm. And so if I'm trusting that camera to keep me out of harm's way with maybe a, my pet or a child that's in the back of the vehicle and that steering angle sensor is off and I'm getting the wrong input as a driver, yep. I could hit something that I don't want to do. Yeah. Another, another important point about this is that to identify your trim levels at time of vehicle drop off. Even though this is a 2011 and it's got 100,000 plus miles on it, it still is a platinum edition Armada. So that means intelligent key, around view camera system, you know, parking sensors, things that the base model didn't have. And as you repair plan around these vehicles, you got to take into account what trim level am I working on? Right, right. And it's um, and it's not just today's car. No. Um, you know, our average age of the fleet on the road is 11 years. Probably the the average age of what's going to hit into the collision center is about six and up. You know, we get a little bit more like than this. that. Mm -hmm. um, this was a great example of. When, when I hear people say to me, but do I have to do it on that one too? Yes, yes. you have yes, to do it on do. that one too. <laughs> so um, so that's, uh, that's good. Jake, what else did you find throughout the scanning process? Yeah, so we went in, we found, um, you know, I, I, like to pull the, um, I like to pull the airbag inspections and requirements in the event of a collision. And um, Nissan actually did a good job here with um, showing the system on a network. And if you think of like a network in an, in an office and you think of, three workstations, a server, a printer, and a fax machine, all of those things are on the network. And the minute that one of them is unplugged, now none of them communicate with that component nope. anymore. Cars are no different. Mm -hmm. As you get into this, a, this is the airbag network of the car. Yeah, As you can see, the driver airbag, passenger airbag, crash zone sensor, I would want to know where that is. Occupant detection system, the pretensioners for the seat belts, satellite airbag safing sensors that have G-force uh, sensors in them that detect motion. So this airbag system, even though it's similar to Honda's, actually operates very differently. So when you're trying to explain this to insurers, you're trying to explain it to customers, pull the description and operation of those control modules and read the information. That way when you're talking about it, you're comfortable. All now, right. now think about this, when you're building the estimate, if you don't have all this information, how accurate is your first bid gonna be? Yeah. And really, once again, I wanna start to make this point clear is that that estimate is setting the tone of repairs. The technicians don't know all this stuff. They're not getting all this information to, to them all the time. And so it really needs to be identified at the beginning portions of the estimate when that is yeah. created. And Roger, I'll tell you that, you know, I, I, just the battery disconnected one, I keep going back to that one because it's such a huge one. Even within a single manufacturer like Toyota, yep. that procedure is different from Corolla to Tacoma to Camry to Tundra and so on. So they're all, they're all equipped differently. So yep. the procedures are different, even though it's the same manufacturer. So really what I need to be doing every time is looking up information all the time, regardless yep. of the make, model, year, and it's gotta be fresh information. Yeah. Right. You don't know what you don't know. No. That's and right. it looks like this customer didn't know some things were going on with the car. Larry, it's not, it's not color time. What's going on here? <laughs> uh, well, like I said, we found that the opposite side of the vehicle was not painted and that the back gate was not painted. And what we came up with on the side of this vehicle is that the front fender was painted at one time, the upper outer unicide was painted at one time, same thing with the door, the front door, the rear door, and obviously the quarter panel that was changed. There's a lot of inconsistency in spray pattern. Yeah. Um, even the way they sanded it to prep it, because um, you can make an undetectable blend or, 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 or uh, and clearing the whole panel if you sand it the right way and you can actually make it pretty much undetectable. Uh, a lot of inconsistency on the quarter panel and the, my two bigger issues is my sectioning procedure um, that they chose in this particular car was right here above the door handle uh, opening area here and down over here on this quarter panel in the back here and if you look at the repair procedure from uh, Nissan for this. Those uh, are not in those no. areas. There's backing pieces in there uh, that we found with um, extensive amount of corrosion behind there. And uh, the section is <coughs> supposed to be higher up in this pillar and on an angle uh, at the top corner there, just below the roof line area, uh, where that's supposed to be sectioned in, and it's an open butt joint is what they want. You know, speaking of that, Larry, when I've worked with the car companies in the past, they will purposely design some of the inner structure to accommodate this repair. 
meaning that it, they'll dish it out a little bit so it gives the technician more room to work. So if they don't put it in the right place, they could actually damage that reinforcement. And when that damage, when that takes place in that reinforcement, even if they cut through it a quarter of an inch, that reinforcement is now oh, junk in some model cars. The other thing too is, I, you know, in those areas also, they're using foam. And so if I put it in the wrong location, I could have fires. Well, you could sort of fire, you could have stuff drip down in there and cause an issue. And um, another thing that we found that we, uh, once again, that this has an air conditioning unit in the back, yep. and we're not going to take it apart to this extent right now because there's some issues with this car. We can already prove that, once again, the panel has to come off. It's incorrect. Mm -hmm. uh, what it's welded to, I didn't do any destructive testing, but I found some issues with corrosion getting in on the inside over there. So we're going to have inner panels on the inside. I mean, this shop could possibly wind up buying this customer a brand new car, and we have an issue with some fraud probably because the outer wheelhouse was listed as replaced. I have no indications to prove it right now. I have to do some further testing. We do have a question that somebody brought in. We don't know who from, but it says if we have, par if we have a parts store or if a service department changed the battery, should I have a scan performed? Well, I think that's pretty much of a yes. Yeah. You just brought it up. <laughs> yeah. Anytime the battery's yeah. disconnected, you yeah. have to do this type of stuff. At the, at the very minimum, you definitely want to pull the procedure for that battery to determine if there's any reset procedures, just like this Nissan. Um, another little trick is you can go in, if you're using an all data or an equivalent, uh, go in the search box and type in the word relearn or scan, and those will help you find diagnostic relearning and reinitialization procedures for those cars. <clears throat> All right, things. so the let's go. Let's, we got we got a little bit of time that we're going to do, and we want to finish up this car. So, Larry, you basically had discovered um, we had an improper section. Um, the estimate had, it included the um, inner quarter um, in wheelhouse. It included the quarter panel, and then it included and a that floor pan or something. Uh, floor pan repair, and then there is an additional, almost like an inner quarter extension. That's kind of. I like didn't it. find an inner quarter extension that was replaced based on what we saw in the database system for. Autotech CCC and also for the manufacturer's uh, um, you know, blowout or, or explode, exploded view of the, the components. The outer wheelhouse shows no indications, comparative left side to right side, and even the amount of dirt that's in there, that mm -hmm. it's been changed. Not even rusting on the inside compared to the rusting I caught on the inside with the bore scope. Yep. Um, or even in the flange areas. No attempt to put corrosion resistant primers or anti-corrosion compounds, the gummy gooey stuff flooded inside there. Mm -hmm. uh, so those are some issues there. Now, we had all this and I said, okay, you know what? Well, let's, we have the equipment. I want to measure it because I'm not happy with a bunch of stuff. And like anything else, you start with the frame to get your center line and then you move up from there. Yep. I didn't waste time measuring the upper body because mm -hmm. already the quarter has to be changed. So I didn't bother with that. I checked the, the, the structure of the vehicle, and uh, it's probably flashing on their view now. My issues are is that both um, the rear rails at the very end are, are up 9 and 10 millimeters, respectively. Um, and then right before the, um, the trailer hitch, uh, right in front of the trailer hitch, it's actually down. So the, the, the rails are kind of like this, like my elbow's being bent. Mm -hmm. And then it kind of rises up a little bit again. Uh, as you get towards the front of the suspension component. So the back end of the car is a little messed up. It's like an S uh, to a certain yep. extent. But now we looked at the front because you've got to measure everything. Like I always say in my EMI 54 theory, measure minimum your four center, four in the front, four in the rear. Well, we measured some stuff in the front. I actually had Madison do it as I was teaching her how to use this system. And she found a bunch of measurements off in the front here that said, okay, we got the front rails are up. So basically the car is a U shape straightening out in the middle in the back it goes like this and raises up again so the the frame has some issues to it and i i i don't know about the drivability of this vehicle but according to what jake had said that the steering angle sense is off yep. i'm just wondering if this woman probably doesn't realize it just thinks it drives funny because she's had it for a year already and i didn't test drive this car so this is another vehicle that's pretty much deemed unsafe to operate yep. uh, until some more stuff is done to it if i had the ability to do it i'd do a, a wheel alignment check if I had Hunter equipment here or some other yep. wheel alignment, to do a wheel alignment check and see where both of these cars are at to see if that was even performed or done. So, Larry, going back to the estimate, were, was there unibody damage on this car or something that identified for repair? Well, they had the, the upper structure, obviously. Right. And they, they had a, a, set, up a, a set up a measure. And there's no indications on the structure of the vehicle that they actually set it up. And this is the problem that people get English wrong, and this is what really annoys me. There is no such thing as set up a measure. There is no set time for it or anything like that. Nope. One you have, there's, unless you're putting it on a select bench or a global jig or a car bench where you build the car and then you compare the vehicle 
to the specs. Correct. Then you have a setup and measure. With a car aligner, a chief, uh, uh, any one of the other uh, 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 systems that are out there, you're not going to have that type of thing like you have with, uh, well, Spinazzi is another one that uses a universal type fixture system like Carbench and, and Global Jig, and then uh, 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 Solette is a dedicated fixture to that particular car. So you have a setup and measure because you're building the specs. This is a comparative of you're measuring the vehicle. We were able to measure this vehicle, even though it's not a quick 42, but because of the height of the vehicle, we were able to measure it on the wheels. This vehicle would have to put up on clamps, so we'd have to jack it up uh, on the machine for that. But we were able to measure this car and find out that there's numerous issues with the frame of the vehicle. Now, that, could that be related to this incident? Possible. Maybe. Could it not be related? I don't know. I never saw the pictures before. And this is where, once again, this is where it differentiates between a post-repair inspector and a quality, uh, 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 quality of repair uh, assessment examination type thing where that's going to go to court and it's not what you think it's what you can prove and it's about the law not about the truth and that's what a lot of guys don't realize so you just can't walk over and say well this has to be replaced because of the you have to be able to prove it there's testing that I have to do sometimes where I have to rip apart quarter panels and actually have a tester on there to see how much tensile strength it pulls apart at and then you have to measure the size of the nuggets that it pulls out if it does to see if it's within the right parameters. So in this case here, I don't know, did the quarter panel, this went back into this quarter panel and cut a big hole through here? We don't Could know. that be a possibility? Sure. Yes, then I don't think I would anticipate the frame being damaged. Or did the car get walloped in the back and got hit this way and moved it around and mm -hmm. that's what caused the frame to be sh you know, shifted over. But there's no indication this car was ever on a frame machine or anchored down, either by the frame or by the upper body. And that's an issue there. So I don't know if they did or didn't measure this car. Yeah. What you could do, you could measure the car without setting it up on a frame machine. Well, getting back to measurements, a lot of people look for visual indicators, looking at door gaps or buckling in panels. But with today's cars and the way the damage flows through the vehicle, it's more unpredictable than Listen, ever before. Listen, in the rear of the car, a lot of times panel gaps, the door operation will give you some indications that there's something off. My, my fingers between a, a wheel well and the, and the, and the uh, wheel. Um, yeah, well, give me some sort of indication. A couple of tram measurements or something, yes. In the front of vehicle, completely off. Yep. Anyone who says that, it's, just, it's almost as dumb as when someone says, um, you know, there's no lights in the dashboard, so there's nothing wrong with the car. Well, right. oh, all the panel gaps are good. This isn't the 1970s where we had body shims. You have cars now, especially a lot of the German cars, the uh, uh, Volkswagens and Audis, they're open rails, basically. You have, a, excuse me, open apron assemblies. You have an upper rail and a lower rail, and there's nothing there except a strut tower. Yep. These things can move dramatically without shifting around or moving panel gaps. And, you know, some cars have crappy panel gaps, I'll be honest with you. So you really don't know sometimes by just looking at the panel gaps. You've got to look at a bunch of indicators. The applied impact force, what direction was it? What do I anticipate from my experience with this type of damage? What mm -hmm. also is broken with it, you know, broken or damaged in this particular collision? That's why it's so important. You have to pre-measure, you have to pre-scan the car, and in some cases, even do a pre-wheel alignment type of thing, or a wheel alignment yeah. check, as they yeah. would say. All yeah. those things remain variables until you eliminate them. Right. And once That's I eliminate it. them, then I know my, everything's good. It's like, you, you don't want me building your house with me digging a hole in the middle of a, a, a forest, and you telling me, well, how big do you want the house? You know, or me saying, Jake, you know what, hold that straight and Roger, you nail it down. Now, okay, Kristen, you move over 18 inches. I mean, you know, no, 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 that's 50 inches. Move back a little bit. I mean, what do they build the house with? A tape measure? Yeah. Which, how expensive a tape measure? And it starts a level? with a blueprint, though, first. Yeah. Right, but it starts with a blueprint from an engineer yep. who's called an architect. Yeah. And, you know, really, when you build a house, you're using a level and you're using a, a tape measure, which is not expensive, under $1,000. You could buy a really expensive uh, level. But what do we have to use? Look at all the equipment and stuff and the training. We almost have to be para-engineers. And I'm talking the damage assessors have to look at it this way, the shop management. We're, we're not doing oil changes to these cars. They're so much far advanced, and everyone wants their car done in three days. Yeah. And it doesn't work that way, not with these types of cars. People's yeah. lives are at stake. Yeah. Yeah. Let's go ahead and just, uh, Larry, open that rear door there for me real quick. <clears throat> Now, one of the things, Roger, I think you and I all want to talk about, kind of maybe from the insurance perspective, is this is, for this market, probably the most certified OEM collision center, probably in the state. Okay. Um, they are certified for some European models. They're certified for pretty much all the domestics and a couple of the Asians. Um, large, very nice, very well-equipped facility. Mm -hmm. and and. You know, maybe I don't know as an as a reinspector for an insurer. Maybe everything that Larry knows, I do have access. I should have access to the OEM information. Sure. But when we started tearing this apart, 
We got primer on the carpet. We've got primer on the entire wiring harness. <laughs> and the back side of the welds are all covered with just uh, um, a weld through primer, not primer surface, not epoxy primer, nothing. And basically it's flaking off at your fingernail. Did we right. see some so panel adhesive in there too? We did see some panel adhesive. Yeah. In fact, we left it and we'll go around here to the rear see if we can get a shot in here. Um, and in fact, if someone will fire up the Kristen cam a little bit, um, in the course of the repair, and Larry, do we use panel bond adhesive on the Nissan Armada? There should only be panel bonding adhesive, which we're not going to see because of the way this is, right. uh, that, that air conditioning unit's in there, mm -hmm. and I couldn't get back there with a bore scope. should just be on the outer wheel lip area over here, and it's supposed to be sound dampening material, which is classified as a foam, works like an adhesive, looks like urethane, yep. funny right. enough, most of the time. And that's what a lot of the foreign... Uh, your European and Asian companies use around that wheel lip area. But you know, getting back to your point, Chris, and even though this car, this repair shop had all these certificates, if the culture does not buy into a process like, so we don't have these outcomes, right? the customer loses. Right, and, and here's a, a, a prime example of where we, we just basically lost control of the cartridge and we let adhesive just drip everywhere on the inside of this car as we were installing it and we may Hopefully we can get in here and see if I can get you guys in on those welds. You can see there where that's all still left really raw in there. Let me try to fix it. And there should be some mm. pictures also floating okay. around about the uh, bore scope that we yeah, took exactly. earlier that we were able to get in there. Yeah. Um, there's a question popping up while you're, while you're taking some of those shots in the inside. Uh, Sergio's asking us, um, I have many cars that come from other shops. What can we do to help customers obtain, the pro uh, obtain a proper repair if they don't want to be held accountable? Well, you, you can. You, you, there's nothing that you can have a customer sign off on that frees you from liability. You're the repair professional. Correct. So you either repair the car properly or you let it go down the road and say, look, I can't work on this car. I'm not doing that. I can't. I mean, would you, would you put in a, um, the, the customer wants you to roll up an airbag and glue it back closed again so it looks good? Would you do something like that? Um, you, you know, would you, it, it's just not a smart We've thing to do. We've had some cases like that, haven't yeah. we, right? <laughs> we have. <laughs> Here, Sergio, Sergio, I think that uh, what I would add to that is that maybe that's a car we shouldn't fix. We move on to the next one. And when you're presenting that information, make sure the customer understands that here's what your car manufacturer is telling us to do. It's not me, Sergio, the repairer telling you that what I think. Here's what the car manufacturer says that we need to do to make your car safe and perform a proper repair. You know, and speak, think about this too. When I go out and talk to different repair facilities, they're saying, I ask them, who is their customer? Well, it's this bill payer or that bill payer. No, the customer of the car is the vehicle owner. Yep. And so if a bill payer is not cooperating with you and you can't provide documentation, you have to talk to the customer. You can't let the car go out in a substandard way. I, and I would say that, you know, Roger, too, if I was, if I was still back in the days wearing my insurance hat. Um, my customer is the customer, and my job is to ensure their safety Correct. and the longevity of that car and to keep them and retain them as a policyholder. My concern is not necessarily cost and cycle time and all those things. It's one car at a time. Yep. Take the car in front of you on its merits mm -hmm. and do the right thing for that car. Mm -hmm. um, you got to remember, the, the, the words that come out in these repair manuals, remember a lot of times the lawyers have to look at it for the state and stuff like that, oh, you know, yeah. for, the for the company, you know, for state laws or government laws. You know, remember, you, we need, a, as an industry, you need to actually hold people accountable when they say to you, well, it's only a recommendation. Re go look up the word dic in the dictionary, recommendation, see exactly what it means. Then go look up in a law dictionary what recommendation means when it comes from a manufacturer. You'll see a completely different aspect of what you think it means. Just like a, a manufacturer recommends you use 20 weight 50. If you don't use 20 weight 50 and you put straight 50 weight oil in there, or straight 20 weight oil, and you blow the engine, do you think they're going to guarantee the motor? Not no, they're not. We don't make them, we don't design them, we don't sell them, we don't buy them, we don't drive them. Well, we do it for our own person, but the ones that are in our shop, we don't drive them, we don't wreck them, we don't insure them, we don't collect premiums, but we fix them. We fix and there's a book that tells us on how to fix these cars. Yep. And this is a prime example here. This is no different, because I looked at the procedures, okay, and if resistance welders were available, and they allow you to do mag plug welds on this if you wanted to, but I looked at it, and it's no different than a 1980s or 1990s steel car. And this supposedly well-certified shop, which basically doesn't ensure the fact without systematic checks within the shop, and even a third-party check, couldn't even repair a, a steel car the right way. Yeah. So we're not talking think, aluminum. We're not talking carbon fiber. When you, when you think about this, Larry, then, you know, I see that they suggested um, compression-resistant spot welds, and I have a MIG. 
uh, I'm just going to put this in because I've fixed cars for 30 years. That's totally unacceptable. It is. It can only be fixed one way and one way only, and that's what the manufacturers describe in their repair strategies. Would you weld on a fender that's bolted on? No. Well, well I, I, and once again, everyone's sure? going to say the same thing, <laughs> yeah. you know, but they'll go ahead and they'll go, well, you know, they want me to use resistance welding or, or BMW wants me to glue and rivet yeah. uh, um, the, you know, the panel on and I'm going to go ahead and weld it on. I know better. Right. You know, I never had an issue. Yeah, so let's bring this all home here a little bit for kind of how we did post repair inspections mm -hmm. and what we were, um, what were our objectives were for today. Uh, Roger, let's start from the insurer's perspective a little bit. I had two cars. One was a happy customer, great cycle time, great CSI score, um, repairability, lots of repair on that estimate. KPI wise, that one scored really well. It did. Um, and I had a problem. So necessarily thinking that a car is maybe low impact or below a $3,000 threshold estimate doesn't mean that maybe I still don't need to be taking a look at what repairs are coming out. Exactly. And so, uh, you know, when you have a low impact yeah. like this, as a repairer, you have a responsibility. Check the car in detail and provide that information to the bill payer so you can justify why you're doing what you need to do. Right. Now, then, on this car, I had a shop that was arguably probably one of the best in the state, yep. right? Every certification, um, OEM, um, the training they had met to meet the classifications for, for those. Um, it looked good. This was probably a shop that maybe in the past, maybe as an insurer, I wouldn't have worried about, but should I have been reinspecting them as well? Yep, and then the question comes back to how deep can we go in that reinspection? And so we have to basically be asked challenging questions to the repair facility, what strategies were used, let me see your test welds, what kind of adhesive did you use? It has to go deeper than the gaps and the paint job. Right, yep. right. we really gotta take some looks. Now, Larry, um, from the repairer's perspective, I think today from both cars, we had two themes. We had failure to access OEM repair information and failure to do the scanning and diagnosis and calibrations that would have been required. Um, could a repair facility really avoid a lot of issues, maybe seeing me and you coming in or having to yeah. face us on the other side of a witness table? Um, by just simply accessing and following the OEM procedures on every repair. Read the, read the instruction manual for the car, follow the recommended uh, uh, products, materials, apparatuses they want you to use. Um, you know, plan it out systematically. Don't rush through a job, plan it out properly. Don't start on a repair until all the parts get into the shop. Yep. And listen, the best thing to do is, I'm working on the car, Kristen's the foreman or the, even the, the estimator in the shop. Charge. She walks by <laughs> and she goes, well, normally you belong in the kitchen, right? Um, <laughs> so she comes by and Are she- Are you talking about my weight? <laughs> no, women belong in the I'm kitchen. I'm just wondering. <laughs> from our, from our, our website stuff. Um, <laughs> She comes over and I go, I did this, this, and this. Now, Kristen looks at the car and she looks behind the weld. She sees that. She sees that because everything's out of there. She can see I have the anti-corrosion compound in there or I have my primers in there or we mark someplace that corrosion compound has to be put in after it's painted. But she checks it. She also saw that I had the car trial fitted with parts on because trial fit's not included and you need to trial fit stuff. Right. Most of the manuals tell you, even GM, not even a wacky German company in Christ to tell you when putting on a B pillar, trial fit the doors and make sure and ensure they fit properly. Yep. Okay, regardless of what system you're using to hold the, the pillars in the right way, but how do we know the door was assembled or built the right way? You gotta trial fit it on. Sometimes they gotta be, you know, kicked or moved. Something has to be adjusted. And you gotta remember, just like when you adjust different parts, I put a fender on a car, I might have to move a hood that wasn't damaged because it was originally lined up with a different fender. I'm putting a different fender on there now. Some adjustments might have to be made. Check everything first. Move along. These are not oil changes we're doing. We're not doing tire rotation. These cars are much more advanced. And we have to take the time and the process to do it. And no one could ever say to me, well, they didn't pay for it, or they didn't have this, or I, I couldn't. No, th those are excuses. Right. Don't exactly. come up with excuses. You got a question on something, you, you're always free to get in touch with yeah. us or anything like that. Yeah. But it, it's a big issue that um, guys don't realize what, what, what kind do. of damn, uh, risk you can put somebody at. Right. Now, Jake, scanning. I yeah. think, um, you know, it's been the hottest topic in the industry right now. And a lot of us has thought that scanning, or we've approached scanning as a, extra process i yeah. believe that we feel has been added to the repair or whatever but i think today you've proved that scanning and calibration is an integral process in Definitely. the repair not just something yeah. that's hey before i deliver yeah and, and you know these two cars were very basic um, we found some issues with them but you know as more and more of these systems move away from mechanical parts doing the job think of a throttle body with a cable going to it to now it's a throttle body with an electronic control module hooked to it like the nissan here
-hmm. So now you've got steps that are required to get that throttle body to open and close properly, and that's the idle air relearn piece. So as more and more of those systems come on, think of hybrid systems with the water pumps that are electric. Think of brake calipers that have electronic control modules on them. There are going to be calibration and reinitialization steps that are required when you service these items. Yep. All right. So there, as you can see, there is lots to the post repair inspection process. But as a repairer, I'd be thinking about my quality control measures within my facility. And how do I prevent situations like this from getting out and getting into my customers' hands? Remember, my reputation, well, it's really all I've got. So my ability to maintain and continue to be a repair facility in this country, well, that's keeping customers happy and keeping happy customers safe. Right. So we're going to want to make sure we do those cars correctly. As an insurer, um, you know, I think it's time maybe that we rethought the way we were looking at our DRP shops. I know that when we make that recommendation and we put our stamp of seal of approval on that repair facility, that we're entrusting the care and safety of our policyholders to that facility. And maybe we need to be doing a little bit more looking at the quality, not just looking at the KPI sheets that are coming out. Well, and numbers, quality yeah. beyond the pants, <coughs> going much deeper. Yeah. Right, exactly. So. Um, we, we do apologize, we did have that little issue of audio, and we right. finally got it back up and got the show out. It will be available for replay within probably the next 24 hours for you to get to. If we didn't get to your question today on the show, or if you think about a question at a mm -hmm. later date, feel free to reach out to us on the website. We would love to answer yep. that question. Uh, Roger and Jake and Larry are always handy, so if I can't cover it, well, then they're definitely going to get that answer to you, too. And don't forget... I want to say something when you... No, go, go, go. Are you sure? I'm Remember, I'm the foreman. I'm okay. in charge. Well, you're in charge, right. I'm saying. <laughs> uh, listen, if you got questions also, guys, you can post them on the, you know, right. the Collision Repair Technicians uh, uh, group website, you know, mm -hmm. excuse me, group on Facebook. Uh, please post the questions. Uh, tag me or Kristen in so we can answer that question for you. Uh, we'll be more than glad to do yes. that. And also look for us next month. Yeah, yeah. At the Northeast Trade Show, we're going to be, and we'll probably be doing this class live mm. there. And Jake and I, along with uh, uh, um, uh, Carolina, are going to be having a um, pre-measuring, pre-scanning, uh, let's prevent a post-repair nightmare mm -hmm. from happening to yep. us yes. at the Northeast Trade Show. We're going to be doing a class, and I believe we're going to have uh, some German high-end car uh, there, along with a regular car, just to show both modern cars, but we're going to show what the issues could be yes. and that the similarities between, let's say, I'm not sure if we'll get a Chevy in up, but like a Chevy and a yep. S-Class Benz, yep. that a lot of stuff could be the same, yeah. even with a different cars. So, so if you're on the East Coast, be sure to check out the Northeast Trade Show, roll into Jersey and visit us. I think we all have classes that we'll be offering over the three days of that show. Yep. Um, will be a lot of great information there. And don't forget next month, next live episode, as we start to cover a little bit of estimating issues yep. mm -hmm. um, that the shops will need to make sure um, it's all about getting paid, right? Can't work. About our pages paid. and That's stuff, right. setting yeah. up for our later on this year yeah. for the quarter Can't panel afford replacement. OEM information if I don't get paid. That's right. Can't afford a frame machine if I don't get paid. Got to get a scanner. Can't, Can't afford get paid. Aztecs if you don't get right? paid. Right? <laughs> this is great product placement. We appreciate your time, and we will see you next month on Repair University Live.